And now, let's join Ace Broadcaster Mamode Akuga as he takes us inside the Niger Delta. Hello out there and welcome to the program. It's Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil rich region. I'm your regular host, Mamode Akuga. We begin today's program with a special report on the continued importation of petroleum products into the country and the federal government's fuel subsidy scheme. Next in our lineup for today's package is an update on the East Westwood Reconstruction Project as the federal government releases more funds to facilitate its completion. We will, in the course of the program, bring you the reaction of Isoko youths to perceived marginalization in the implementation of the presidential amnesty program. And finally, in today's package is a report highlighting objectives of a planned enterprise development summit and exhibition put together for youths in the Niger Delta by the Nigerian Young Professionals Forum. Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region will be back in just a moment. Don't go away. Introducing the new face of the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, NIMASA. We are charting the direction for a maritime and regulating the industry for a better, bigger, and more economically stable Nigeria. Evolved to serve you better. We are NIMASA. New face, rejuvenated service. NIMASA. Changing the tides in your favor. Welcome back. It's Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil rich region. Following an unprecedented crash in the price of crude oil in the international market, the federal government recently approved a downward review in the price of premium motor spirit PMS from 145 naira to 125 naira per liter. According to the federal government, the price adjustment was made to reflect a reduction in the landing cost of the product. In their reaction, some industry players and close observers of recent developments in the oil sector have called on the federal government to explore quicker means of ending fuel importation and subsidy to safeguard the Nigerian economy from further collapse. Correspondent Chika Bodozie has details. The major fallout of the recent crash in the price of crude oil in the international market has been a significant drop in the landing cost of petroleum products imported into the country. According to the Petroleum Products Pricing Regulatory Agency, PPPRA, the landing cost of PMS dropped from about 131 naira 62 kobo to 84 naira 6 kobo per litre at the close of trading on January 31, 2020. Several weeks later, on March 18, 2020, the federal government announced a downward review in the price of petrol from 145 naira to 125 naira per litre, in line with its price modulation policy. Government's action was immediately greeted with mixed feelings from industry players and petroleum sector analysts. It's a move in the right direction uh, with the reduction in price of crude oil, or the production cost will be reduced because crude oil constitutes the greater proportion of the um, production cost. Therefore, we will expect that because it will be reduced, so Nigeria will be purchasing at a lower price. However, I'm not sure that the old price would have paid for everything. So it's good to at least reduce, so at least people will believe that there are some changes. But those changes are not really reflected properly. Owing to the moribund state of its four refineries, Nigeria has over the years resorted to fuel importation to meet the ever-increasing fuel needs of its vast population. In a bid to pay the difference in huge production and landing cost of fuel importation, the federal government introduced an oil subsidy policy to cushion the effects on Nigerians. After running the subsidy regime for several years, it was obvious that it was constituting a major drain in Nigeria's finances and promoting massive fraud and corruption in the petroleum downstream sector. To checkmate this situation, the government of President Goodluck Jonathan in 2012 took the hard decision of removing the subsidy on petroleum products. The reaction of the public and the opposition party at that time was massive protest across the country that practically grounded all socio-economic activities. Yeah. 
President Muhammadu Buhari, a former petroleum minister and an opposition leader at that time, told Nigerians that there was nothing like petroleum subsidy. For him, the subsidy regime was just a massive fraud. If anybody said he is subsidizing anything, he is a fraud. So all these people talking about subsidy, who is subsidizing him? I need the petroleum economist who will explain to me this question of subsidy. It's sheer fraud and corruption. May 29, 2015, enter Muhammadu Buhari, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He promised to fight corruption in all sectors of the economy, including the petroleum industry. An anti-corruption crusader, the obviously well-intentioned Muhammadu Buhari seemed to have been overwhelmed by political compromise and an unseen cabal with great influence as he has continued with the subsidy regime. The first three months Buhari took over the government, from good luck Jonathan. It was, there was a magic. The refineries pick up production. As a matter of fact, in Gore refinery, they didn't have the capacity for the storage of refined product. But somewhere along the line, I don't really know where the shortfall came from. It's like there was no follow up, or they saw a vacuum and they went back to square one. So if they have picked up that system, I don't think there's need for us to import petroleum products. There's no need. There's something they know we don't know, or there's some, some politics that goes on into petroleum product subsidy that nobody should know. It's a kind of cult. It's a kind of um, uh, secret society, economic secret society, that uh, when you get in there, you shut up your mouth and you'll be part of it. Uh, if that's not the case, why should Buhari say that severally and say that when he comes there, that since there's no subsidy, Nigerians will get it at exactly what they're supposed to get it. But now Nigerians are not only paying subsidy, Nigerians are paying double what they used to pay when Jonathan was there. So the contradiction is huge and nobody can explain it away. If you ask me, there's no way I can explain because I'm not in their minds. But all I know is that Nigerian is supposed to be refining its petroleum products and be selling it at market rate. And the differential becomes money government should invest in basic infrastructure. However, considering the high level racketeering in the oil subsidy scheme and the need to eliminate it, the Buhari government at its inception decided to make the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, the sole importer of petroleum products. Although the federal government's action had signaled an end to what was generally viewed as a costly and corrupt subsidy regime, the country has over the years spent a fortune to subsidize the cost of petroleum products consumption. By December last year, the government was subsidizing a liter of PMS with 47 naira 5 kobo. According to a recent report by the PricewaterhouseCoopers, the federal government spent about 2.3 trillion naira as subsidies on petrol and power consumption between 2015 and 2018, which amounted to 17% of the country's foreign reserves and 26% of the 2019 federal budget. And for the opt-in time, the International Monetary Fund last year appealed to Nigeria to cut down spendings on oil subsidy to keep the economy afloat and reduce a huge gap between the rich and the poor. We believe that removing fossil fuel subsidies is the right way to go. Uh, if you look at our numbers from 2015, it's no less than about $5.2 trillion that are spent on fuel subsidies and the consequences thereof. And the Fiscal Affairs Department has actually identified, you know, how much would have been saved fiscally, but also in terms of human life if there had been the right price on carbon emission as of 2015. Numbers are quite staggering. If that was to happen, then there would be more public spending available to build hospitals, to build road, to build schools, and to support education and health for the people. Given the economic realities on ground, the federal government has been urged to rethink its oil subsidy policy. The Buhari government is not against the removal of the petroleum subsidy, but Finance Minister Zainab Ahmed says the removal must be gradual. We'll say it's good advice, 
but also we have to implement it in a manner that is both successful as well as sustainable. We are not uh, in a situation to wake up one night, one day and just remove subsidy. We have to educate the people, we have to show the Nigerian citizens what the replacements for those subsidies will be. So we have a lot of work to do and we also need to understand that you don't remove subsidies large amounts in one go, that it has to be graduated and, and the public has to be well informed on, on what you're trying to do. For an economy that is heavily dependent on the oil sector, Nigeria cannot make any meaningful progress without attaining self-sufficiency in crude oil and gas production. It is on this note that stakeholders in the oil industry call on the federal government to gradually bring an end to fuel subsidy. Why are you subsidizing what an average Nigerian does not enjoy? I mean, the lower class does not enjoy. Who enjoys the, petrol, the, 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 the uh, PMS and the rest of them subsidy are actually the rich and the super rich and foreigners that are all drive here and those who are neighboring countries. So I want us to stop talking about their subsidy. I have always said that there's no need for subsidy. Let market forces detect the price. I actually think we have already deregulated diesel and kerosene. There's no noise there. It's more of the PMS. Simple. Allow anybody that has products to bring into Nigeria to bring in. Then get the inspection companies, SGS, Bureau Veritas. These are international companies. Let them inspect. Let it be that is this particular spec of PMS, of petroleum, of petrol, refined petrol that we need in this country that they are bringing in. As long as it meets the spec, that's all. In response to the recent oil price crash, the federal government is contemplating a review of the 2020 budget, whose benchmark of $57 per barrel of crude oil now falls short of its current price in the international market. For most Nigerians, it is a wake-up call on their leaders to carry out sweeping reforms in the oil industry to save money for the government, block leakages, reduce loss and increase investments in other areas of the economy to positively impact on the lives of Nigerians. While a downward review of the price of petrol is welcomed, a more sustainable policy would be to encourage local production of petroleum products, discourage importation, and completely phase out the subsidy regime. Inside the Niger Delta. Commuters along the east-west road may now heave a sigh of relief as the federal government has concluded arrangements to release 20 billion naira for its rehabilitation. Minister of Niger Delta Affairs, Senator Goswell Akbabio, made the disclosure recently in Abuja at a meeting with the managing director of the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority, NSIA, Uche Oji, and contractors handling sections 1 to 4 of the east-west road rehabilitation project. Correspondent Ekanami Ofori has the report. Several years after it was abandoned by previous administrations, President Olusegun Obasanjo awarded contracts for the rehabilitation and reconstruction of the East-West Road in 2006. The project, which was to be completed by 2010 to alleviate the plight of commuters along the road, had lingered for lack of funds to finance it. To ensure its speedy completion, the federal government in 2009 mandated the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs to supervise the East-West Road project. While sections 1 and 3 of the East-West Road project have been completed and are already in use, sections 2 and 4, stretching from Kayama to Port Harcourt, have been in a state of disrepair. Concerned about the slow pace of work on the East-West Road, President Muhammadu Buhari in 2018 transferred the project funding to the Presidential Infrastructure Development Fund under the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority. After parting with about 16 billion naira as historical debt to contractors in the last one year, the federal government has decided to commence work on failed portions of the East-West Road. At a recent meeting with the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority and contractors handling the project, 
Senator Akpabio said, government's renewed efforts to complete the east-west road was a reflection of President Buhari's commitment to infrastructure development in the Niger Delta. This is a renewed commitment on our part. And the president is totally committed to ensuring the completion of this project. He didn't start it, but he's doing it in many other projects, and the Israel's road cannot be an exception. The PIDF has been a very successful initiative of this president. And quite frankly, I think we're very privileged to be managing it and going through a time like this. And I believe with the commitment shown by the minister, and obviously, as we go into our meetings with the contractors, we expect that we will be able to accomplish the objective set by the presidency. At the meeting, Senator Akpabio mandated contractors handling four sections of the east-west route to mobilize to site, noting that arrangements had been concluded to the NSIA for the release of 20 billion naira for a speedy completion of the project. I have visited the road about five times, and I saw that even some of the sections you did had broken down, such as the one in uh, Mpolo Junction and I think Rumodara. That if all contractors can return to site this week, it will make available immediately in the interim about 20 billion to pay for any generated IPC. We expect a very high quality job from you, no cutting of corners, so that we can deliver not just on time, but we can deliver quality infrastructure that will, that will last the test of time. To verify Akpabio's claim, our crew visited a badly damaged spot at Nkbolu Junction in Port Harcourt, which falls within Section 2 of the East-West Road Reconstruction Project. To the relief of commuters, work had commenced in earnest on this portion of the road. The drainage was very low before, but now they've done it very deep. I think it will help us. So all that we are praying is that it will continue and we shall have a good result. And I believe government, as they, much as they have started it, they will accomplish it. The east-west road connects virtually all the states in the Niger Delta by road and provides access to several critical national assets in the region. When completed, it is expected to transform the economic landscape, not only of the region, but the rest of the country that depends on the oil and gas hub for its economic survival. Inside the Niger Delta. A coalition of youth groups in Isoko land has drawn the federal government's attention to the exclusion of the Isoko ethnic nationality from its intervention programs in the Niger Delta. At a recent press briefing in Abuja, the distraught Isoko youths maintained that the marginalization of the Isoko nation was in spite of its immense contributions to Nigerians' economic survival as well as the ongoing peace process in the Niger Delta. Correspondent Lovely Ofigo has more. Soon after crude oil was discovered in Oloibiri in 1956, exploration of the black gold commenced in Isoko land in 1956. By 1958, the first oil well in present-day Delta State was drilled in Uzeri, Isoko South local government area. Shortly after, in 1962, oil was drilled in Olomoro, another Isoko community, also in Isoko South local government area of Delta State. With over eight flow stations and 130 oil wells, Isoko land accounts for one of Nigeria's largest onshore oil producers. Despite its immense contributions to the country's economic survival over the years, the Isoko ethnic nationality has been denied benefits of its oil producing status in the Niger Delta. There is no time that the Isoko have disrupted the production of oil like other communities, but yet, when it comes to benefit, the Soko man will get nothing for their contribution. When you look, all the federal appointments, ambassador, ministers, uh, director in the parastatus, you can't find any Soko man there. Having been excluded from the presidential amnesty program set up in 2009 to produce skills and empowerment for youths in the Niger Delta, the Isoko youths are beginning to wonder if the federal government is taking their peaceful disposition for granted. They call on the federal government, therefore, to allow equity prevail in the administration of the presidential amnesty program. The federal government should revisit the amnesty and see that 
the Isoko nation has been grossly cheated in all ramification of benefit from the federal kafa. The federal government of Nigeria has pushed us to the war. And we are ready to bounce back any moment from now. We are calling on Mr. President through this media to check all he has promised the Isoko people. We want to see that things will start happening right now as we speak to the federal government of Nigeria. The coalition of Isoko youth groups has also called on President Muhammad Buhari to fulfill his promise to look into the plight of the Isoko people when, in July 2018, he met with Isoko leaders at the presidential villa in Abuja. Inside the Niger Delta. The challenge of high unemployment and crime rates will continue to persist without the right policies in place to exploit the creative abilities of young people in the Niger Delta. This was the position of the chairman of the Nigerian Young Professionals Forum, Moses Siloko Siasia, who spoke recently to Inside the Niger Delta on the objectives of the forthcoming Niger Delta Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises Summit and an exhibition in Port Harcourt, the River State capital. Few years back, the Niger Delta was a theater of unbridled violence unleashed by armed youths demanding a fair share of Nigeria's oil wealth from the federal government. Their sustained campaign of economic sabotage practically brought the economy on the verge of collapse, prompting the Nigerian authorities to enter into a peace deal with armed militants in the Niger Delta. With an ever-increasing army of unemployed youths, however, there are fears that a current relative peace may not endure in the region. Chairman of the Nigerian Young Professionals Forum, Moses Siloko Siasia, advocates economic self-reliance to discourage young Niger Deltans from engaging in militancy and other forms of antisocial behavior. In a bid to change the current narrative, his group has concluded plans to organize in Port Harcourt a two-day summit and exhibition to benefit young entrepreneurs in the region. Our people are wallowing in hopelessness. The lack of education, lack of employment has become a critical concern for people like us who are futuristic in our ideology. So we must, as a people, see this as a national emergency. That's why we have actually put up this um, Niger Delta MSME summit together. We want to ensure at the end of the summit that we have a database of those who are involved in productive ventures. It's going to be a sustainable process. And we're also going to get them access, a business linkage access to opportunities, both in country and out country. In recent years, unemployment has assumed disturbing dimensions in the Niger Delta. In the last three years, for instance, the National Bureau of Statistics has consistently ranked rivers, Akwaibom and Bayelsa, as states with highest unemployment rates in the country. Siloko Siasia wants state governments to reduce unemployment by investing more in human capital development. Our young people who are into entertainment, they have to leave the region and go to Lagos for them to excel. Is that what we are building? And these are fundamental issues that, you know, uh, over the years that we have been talking about. Maybe our voices are not loud enough. So we must, as a people, ensure that we create that opportunity, sustainable opportunity, for our young people. But Yelsa Bon Siloko Siasia is convinced that, with mentorship and financial support, more youths in the Niger Delta will begin to embrace entrepreneurship, which the region needs to survive a post-oil economy. Inside the Niger Delta. And with that report, we'll draw the curtain on the program. But just before we go, newly elected chairman of the People's Democratic Party, PDP in River State, Ambassador Desmond Akao, has promised to embark on aggressive membership drive and reinvigorate the party ahead of the 2023 general elections in the state. 
the former Nigeria's ambassador to South Korea and one time Minister of State for the Federal Capital Territory, FCT, was returned unopposed in the recent State Congress of the PDP in River State. The State Congress of the PDP held days after the party successfully elected executive committee members across the 23 local government areas of the state. Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region will be back, same time, same station, next week. Until then, you can follow us on our social media handles showing right now on your screen. Until next week, I am Mamode Akuga saying thank you so much for watching and bye for now.